Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Williams, and we're here to help you make the most of your minerals and royalties. Justin, this week we have an episode that came in from a common question that gets asked that I realize we haven't covered on the show before really in, in depth. You know, We've sort of skirted around the issue. And the question is, can shut-in or abandoned wells be reopened? And Justin, I know this is a question that enters people's minds when they look on their state oil and gas commission and they see that their well is maybe temporarily abandoned as, as a term you'll see or shut in. And then that might throw up a red flag and you're wondering, okay, what's next? Is this well going to start? Is, it, is this well going to ever produce again? You nailed it, Matt. And I think it brings up the question of why would they shut it in? What was the purpose of doing that? And why would they want to cease production? And Matt, this is kind of on the piggyback of, of a recent news story that came out that EQT was going to be curtailing some of their production. And I'm sure if I was in uh, the mineral right owner's shoes, I'd be wanting to know, okay, fine. What are they going to do? Am I going to see this come back? Uh, what is the story? That's a great point. That EQT article that Justin's referring to, that curtailing production is basically shutting in wells. In other words, it's uneconomic for them to continue to produce gas because of the glut of gas and the resulting low natural gas prices that we're seeing right now in the early 2024. We're at historic like 20 year lows on natural gas prices. So, you know, it makes sense that they would like to see prices recover. And from a supply and demand standpoint, because of the elasticity of demand with oil and gas, when you decrease the supply and you know you get closer to the actual demand for that product, then prices should recover, reaching an equilibrium. So that's what they're trying to do by shutting in or by curtailing production is to try to boost up prices so that it becomes economic for them to start to open up wells again. So that is what you see. And that's one very good reason why wells can be shut in. Now, Justin, do you want to talk about some of the other reasons that may cause an operator to shut in wells? Yeah, absolutely, man. And, you know, shutting in a well is one of the ways to control that supply and demand like you've talked about. But there are other ways. So like export of natural gas is something that we were really hoping to see come online. That's been a political issue this year. But aside from supply and demand, a shut in well is one that's been temporarily closed or suspended from production. Uh, and as Matt mentioned, it's often due to economic, but can also be for operational reasons. Maybe there is maintenance issues. There's been regulatory changes on flaring or venting and methane emissions. And then also there's the pipeline infrastructure issues. Maybe the pipeline's under repair. Maybe the pipeline is full and there's no space for them. These are all reasons, Matt, that um, operators would shut in wells. And to get kind of into the nitty gritty on shutting in those wells, the real question comes in on what can be reopened and why. You know, I think if you're asking the question of can a, a, a plugged and abandoned well that's been abandoned for 20 years be reopened versus something they like EQT who shut it in simply for the price reason, it's really two different questions, right, Matt? That's a great point. And we'll cover both of those questions. But for the first question, can a shut in well be reopened? The answer is typically yes. And or it depends. And like the example that Justin gave with EQT, in that situation, it could be just as simple as opening the valve back up and basically lining it up to go through the production separators and all the surface equipment, you know, to treat the gas that's coming off the well. And, you know, yeah, you're fine. You're up and running. You know, you start up the compressors, all the things, and then you're exporting gas again to the pipeline. But in some cases, if it it may depend on how long that well has been shut in as to what needs to be done in order to turn it back on production. And I'll just say, you know, for the first situation, like that EQT situation, let's say that gas prices remain depressed for six months or something like that. And these wells are sitting there shut in for six months or whatever the time period is, a longer period of time than just a few weeks or uh, a few days kind of a thing. When natural gas is produced, in most cases, you have also natural gas liquids, but then also water. And water can stop a well from flowing just because you get the water accumulating in the well bore. And because that well is shut in until you can get uh, a 
depth of water standing in that well that the resulting static pressure from that column of water exceeds the reservoir pressure so you basically kill the well you you know cannot flow the well if you were to open up that well to production nothing would happen and so you might need to take some remedial steps in order to dewater that well in order to allow it to flow again and so in that situation you know it just could be as simple as bringing in some equipment removing the water and then the well will start flowing again on its own or you may have to kick off production and do some different things but if essentially they have procedures for those things to restart wells that get into that situation. So depending on how much pressure is built up because of that column of water, basically reaching an equilibrium or being higher than what the reservoir pressure is, they need to get the water out. They have steps and equipment, depending on the formation, depending on the design of the well, all of those things, they'll, they'll have specific procedures to follow. And then they'll have a crew go out there. It's usually a very simple process. It does cost money you know, to do that, of course, but it's usually pretty simple, you know, a few hours, a crew with some specialized equipment to go out there and uh, bring that well back on. And then you're ultimately limited as to the speed at which you can bring those wells on based on the crew availability and the equipment availability. If you have like all of the wells in that field that are shut in for low prices, and then all of a sudden you have to go out and turn back on a hundred wells. Well, they're not going to all be turned back on in a day, you know, it may take them a week or two to, to restore production. So those are some things you'll see if that is a situation where your well is in, in that category of being shut in for economic reasons. Justin, for well integrity issues, this is another reason why a well could get shut in. And let's talk about a situation where they have to test the pressure of the casing and, you know, go ahead and try to figure out is that well in good condition, or, you know, maybe production engineers are monitoring it periodically or continuously as they're producing oil and gas and they see a spike in pressure or a drop in pressure, depending on where that pressure gauge is. And they say, oh, oops, there's something going on here. It's a potential well integrity issue. We need to go perform a wellhead test on those casing pressures. Do you want to talk about that situation and and kind of what might need to be done there? Sure, man. Yeah. And it could be a situation where maybe there's a hole in the casing string that it's causing fluids to go places they don't belong. And Matt, some states require operators to periodically test the pressure buildup in the annular space of the surface casing and intermediate casing if it's present to make sure that there's no high pressure gas or oil building up in those spaces. And those are the protective layers surrounding the formations that might contain aquifers and that kind of thing. And Matt, when this is the case, there's obviously more cost involved. And there's a testing that needs to be done, often referred to as the Braden head test. And this would be a case where, Matt, the petroleum engineers would go in, they would kind of look at the infrastructure that is in the well, the problems that might be occurring, and as you mentioned, you know, the indicators that they're getting from the different pressures, and they would form a plan for what it would take and what it would cost to rework this well. And depending on the economic situation, it may make sense, it may not make sense if the remaining reserves and productivity potential of that is there. Yeah, that's a great point. It's it's case by case basis. If you have a well integrity issue, you have a piece of equipment that's broken, those things cost money to fix and the operator will assess the economic benefit if we do this project. In other words, if we bring in a workover rig, you know, we have a casing string that's got a hole in it and now it's building high pressure gas is building up in that intermediate casing string or the surface casing where there usually shouldn't be any pressure there. That's a regulatory issue that, you know, they, by law, typically can't operate that well. That Braden has, head test failed. They need to go to the uh, Oil and Gas Commission with a plan to remediate that well. And it could be simple as uh, a cement job. So basically, they go in and run another cement job in and, and squeeze the cement through there and patch up any of those holes. Or, you know, a lot of times it could require running a new casing string, a new production casing string, basically to put an extra barrier in place to meet the regulatory requirements. And that comes with its own set of risks that you have additional cost of the, you know, steel, the the equipment to come in and run in the the new casing. You have to cement it in place and all those things and then recomplete that well potentially. And so it depends on, again, the well design. And then they look at that, okay, to Justin's point, 
what is the remaining reserves? What's the the economic potential? If we go and spend that money, are we going to get the money back in terms of restoring production and you know seeing that economic benefit? And again, it's just looked at on a case by case basis. That's probably the most extreme, you know, where there's a severe, more like well integrity issue that they really can't operate that well legally, or even you know wouldn't be a good idea to do it. And so that is something that would be a deciding factor as to whether or not they need to plug and abandon the well. So you may see in a situation where a well is shut in, it was at the end of its life anyway. It's going to cost too much money to fix it and to restore production, and the amount of production they would get if they spent that money wouldn't be enough to justify the cost then they might just go straight to plugging and abandoning that well. And so they could move the pump jack and put it on another location, get some salvage value out of some of the the steel that's there, and then you know basically plug it and restore it to the original condition. And so that is a possible outcome is that the answer could be, no, the well can't be reopened. And so we're going to go ahead and, and go with the permanent plugging and abandoning. And so that's from the situation if the well was just shut in again for some well integrity issue or some uh, severe issue that was going to be too expensive to fix. Now, it's not uncommon for there to be operational issues like like Justin mentioned, and it might just be something where there is a rod. There's a sucker rod is what the, the term is, is that basically connects the pump in the bottom of an oil well to the pump jack at the surface. And so you see that pump jack pumping up and down, you know, moving up and down. And what that's doing is pushing that rod up and down and pumping that oil out with that pump at the bottom of the well. Well, if that sucker rod breaks, in other words, if that pump jack is moving up and down and that rod is parted somewhere down there, that means that nothing is happening. You know, that rod is just going up and down, but it's not moving the pump at the bottom. In that case, they need to go in with a workover rig, fish out that broken, broken off piece of rod and then replace that section that was corroded or whatever mechanical failure that occurred. And that's a not uncommon thing. And that's a fairly easy fix. You know, again, they have to kill the well to stop it from flowing. In other words, they fill it with water, like the example we gave before. And then they bring in a workover rig, we'll fish out that broken out part, replace it, put it all back together, take the water out, and then the well will start flowing again. So that can be reopened in that situation after the me- mechanical failure is fixed. So there's lots of different examples like that where there are reasons why the well is shut in that are operational in nature. You know, might be that wax has built up. If it's a waxy crude that is being produced, like in Utah, you know, maybe they need to do an acid job. That's a type of a thing where they'll do a chemical treatment. Well, they'll pump down that acid, it'll eat up the the wax and dissolve it, and then the well will start flowing again. And so those are things that can be done. And again, there's production engineers, that's the role that monitors the wellhead pressures and flow rates, and they do that continuously. There's SCADA systems, and there's a, usually a, a small satellite dish there that is transmitting that data back into a database. And then the production engineer logs into their computer. They have all of that telemetry data that they're watching for all of their wells that they're responsible for. And they'll have flags that pop up and say, oop, this well has this situation that means X. You know, They know from experience that if pr- pressure builds up, in this one area, in this one pressure that they're monitoring, it might mean that there is a hole in the tubing. And so they can say, okay, we have a potential issue. We need to put that well on the remediation list. And if it's such that it's not producing anymore, then it gets shut in. It may be that it's just producing at a lower rate because of the hole in the tubing. And so they say, well, we can continue to produce that well, but we need to put it on the list before it gets worse and in order, in order to restore production back to the the curve that we're expecting, basically it drops off and you expect to see lower oil and gas production when you see these types of issues. And so they are looking at that all the time and monitoring that. And these are things that are, it's day-to-day work for these petroleum engineers. So now let's switch gears a little bit, Justin. We've talked about shutting in wells and then reopening them or restarting them and you know, when you can or can't do that. Let's talk about a plugged and abandoned well, because typically when you see that PA, you know, or PNA status on your oil and gas commission website, and you see a well that was on your land and you know it's been plugged and abandoned, you're like, well, that was a done deal. There's nothing that can happen there again. That's not always the case. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, man. And to kind of set the stage for this, from the perspective from a mineral owner, you know, shut in and a plugged and abandoned well 
has different ramifications on the legal side. It has different ramifications for what's required by the operator in your lease. And then also whether the lease is valid or not at times, if that's the only well contained in that lease. And so Matt, with plugging and abandoning a well, it's usually referring to more of a permanently sealed and decommissioned um, situation. Uh, they've ceased production, they've uh, sealed and decommissioned that, they may have to remediate the surface to return that to the original condition. And the reasons can be depleted reserves, environmental concerns, regulatory requirements, and, and perhaps it's the, the operator abandoning that lease or that area or whatever it may be. But typically, Matt, they're really referring to that being a more of a permanent thing. But there are times where West Texas is a great example. They've returned to these areas after a bus cycle, and perhaps they want to go into different formations or different zones and redrill. And Matt, uh, I'm sure it comes down to the engineer looking at whether a new drill or to use some of the existing infrastructure would make sense, but it is a possibility. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think you you hit on a really important point that the from a mineral and royalty owner perspective, it's a very different situation. Unless you have another well on that lease that is holding your lease, it's you know, in other words, that lease is held by production. When they plug and abandon that well and it stops producing, typically your lease expires. And so if an operator were to go into an area that there were no active oil and gas leases and no other producing wells, they would need to approach you to release that acreage to whatever they intend to do, whether that's to drill a new well or to re-enter an existing well, to recomplete it or to drill drill from that original vertical well bore into a different zone or whatever. You know, they need to come to you and get a new oil and gas lease before they can do that. So that is something to, to be aware of. And like you mentioned, Justin, I think the important thing to think about is whether or not this becomes a viable option. It's really dependent on many factors. It's potentially more risky because you don't know how the previous operator uh, abandoned that well. I saw just in doing a little search and doing some research for this episode that the the rumor was in like West Texas with Texaco, the the foreman would would drop a upside down drill bit in the hole to ensure that no one else could go ahead and drill it out in the future. So whether that's actually true or, you know, just oil field lore, who knows, but there's a history of maybe not the best operators drip, dropping a bunch of junk in the well. So they didn't have to dispose of, you know, whatever excess oil field equipment or parts or whatever, they would just drop that stuff down the well bore, cement plug would go in there. And so who knows what you're going to find when you go and drill it out. Of course, you'll find a cement plug and they'll have to drill through that, which is not an issue. You know, when you think about when they drill through rock, it's the same type of a thing and probably harder than that cement plug. So it's not a technical issue for them to drill through that cement plug to access the well bore that is not filled with cement. Or even if the whole thing was filled with cement, they could drill it out. That's not a big deal. But the issue becomes, you know, what, when was that well originally drilled? What was the well bore design? You know, is it something where it is sufficient that it'll maintain well bore integrity and protect those surface zones and surface aquifers from any contamination? And so they have to have multiple casing strings and they, you know, what is the diameter of that original casing? So all these things go into the consideration. Do we need to go in and drill a new well here or is it going to be cheaper just to drill out this existing well bore? And, you know, certainly if you're going to drill a horizontal well. Most of the operators won't mess with reentering an uh, old shut-in well. You know what you're going to get when you drill in a virgin rock. You know, you, you know there's going to be potentially some geologic issues or risks, but for the most part, you know, you're 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 not having to deal with drilling in and then finding an upside-down drill bit that you can't drill through. And then now you've spent all this time to reenter this old well. Then now you got to reabandon and then move over and drill a completely new well. So there's reasons why I would say not a super common thing to see, but I have looked recently at some permits in Colorado, for example, on the Eastern Plains where they're reentering some older wells and now they're going after helium. And so it could be a situation where that well bore design was perfectly fine for producing helium for, you know, relatively low pressure gas and with, with the helium mixed in. And so either way, an operator would have to go to the oil and gas mission to get approval to do that, have to outline their plans on how they're going to reenter the well, how are they going to ensure well bore integrity. So they might need to do things like run a cement bond log, which basically is a 
inspection of that existing wellbore to make sure that the cement job that was there is good and is going to be sufficient to protect any other zones that you're not going to be producing from. And so a lot of things that go into it. And again, it boils down to economics and regulatory considerations as to whether or not this becomes an option. Obviously, you can save a lot of money if you can reuse an existing wellbore, you know, just drill out the plugs and go in and recomplete it the new zone and put in a packer and, you know, seal off the old part that you're not interested in or whatever, or leave it, you know, abandoned. And so it could be a really inexpensive way for them to access a shallower formation. And that is sometimes referred to as an uphole recompletion. And so, and that could be a reason to go in and reenter a, a plugged in abandoned well. Maybe now with hydraulic fracturing, you find that, well, we can actually access the reserves that weren't available when they originally completed this well because of technological advancements and things like that. So yeah, it could be an option. That said, Justin, you want to talk about some of the other challenges and risks that may go with that? Yeah, absolutely, ma'am. Then, you know, to your effect, what you were talking about, you know, operators nowadays, information is everything. And I'm sure if that operator is in an area where they've been for many, many years and they have documentation on what was done with that well originally when it was plugged and abandoned, that would be a huge leg up in the decision whether to recomplete those. And records have only gotten better as as time have gone on. So maybe that'll become more common. And like you said, Matt, for other resources like helium or lithium, uh, maybe we'll see more of that. But some of the other risks, Matt, um, environmental concerns, regulatory compliance. Uh, I'm sure working with the uh, government agencies to ensure that that well is safe to produce from is a top of mind for those organizations. And then well integrity issues, potential for the blowouts. They have to be sure what if they're going to go back in. If you think about something that was drilled in the 40s or 50s and they have absolutely zero idea what they might be encountering, the last thing they want is an EPA disaster or the press that comes with that. And then technological limitations or advancements. You know, how old is the original well bore, Matt? And there are wells that are very, very old that are in in Texas, for instance. Matt, do you want to talk about kind of what is the likelihood? I would say that probably the scenario of them shutting in a well due to to recess prices is probably the most common, right? That's the number one thing we hear. And then I would say second would be operational issues. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah. If we were going to talk about the frequency or the probability of these things happening, I would say that whether it's an operational issue or economic issue, that is probably the most common for a well to get shut in. And that is typically a temporary shut in. In other words, once that condition is resolved, then they will restore that well to production, whether that means commodity prices uh, recover to where it's profitable to produce and sell that commodity again, then you know that would be a, one reason. And the other one is if it's still economic, that well has got plenty of life left in it, need to schedule a crew or schedule the equipment to go in and fix whatever operational issue might have occurred. Or you know, like you mentioned earlier, and we didn't really touch on it in the shut-in scenario, but another very common scenario is where takeaway capacity becomes a limiting factor on whether or not that well can be produced. And so that might mean that the well is producing at a lower rate. So whether it actually gets shut in or not depends on how severe that infrastructure bottleneck is. You know, for gas wells, that might mean a compressor station goes down in the pipeline that they produce into. So the line pressure, in other words, the pressure in that pipeline is higher than the pressure coming out of the well bore and or if there's a compressor on the on the lease and you know maybe that can only boost pressure so much to get into the pipeline and if that pipeline pressure is up higher than that uh, compressor can put out or that the well bore pressure is then that well will stop flowing and so they'll shut it in they'll wait until that situation is resolved you know typically that's a a day or two type of a thing. If it's just an operational issue, like a compressor station goes down for something or a maintenance issue with the midstream company and the pipeline infrastructure, or it could be if it's a takeaway capacity issue, that could be a longer term thing because they might need to go in and put in more pipelines, put in additional compressor stations to allow for more takeaway capacity. In that situation, you might be dealing with that shut in well for that reason for several months or a year or two, depending on how much production is coming on. And I saw an article here recently about West Texas and the Permian Basin, where this is starting to become a concern because there is so much associated gas that is produced with these oil wells that are being drilled in the Permian Basin that the gas takeaway capacity is becoming a constraint 
again. And so, and when I say associated gas, I mean natural gas that's produced as a byproduct of oil. So again, a lot of times in these formations, there's oil and gas there, and maybe you're mainly going after the oil and that's what the you know, primary product that that well is going to produce, but it also is going to produce a lot of natural gas along with the oil. And so you have to deal with it. And so that becomes a limiting factor on how much oil you can produce because you need to be able to do something with the gas. And that is why, you know, things like Bitcoin mining and AI computing, you know, with these mobile data, data centers that they're putting on the well pads beca- is becoming more of a thing in West Texas is because there's so much excess gas. The gas prices are bad enough with Henry Hub being about $1.75 or whatever when we're recording this in April of 2024. Well, the prices at the Waha Hub in the Permian are like negative or like zero or like 10 cents or 25 cents per MCF. And so, They'll get more money by selling it at a very low price to a Bitcoin miner or to a company that has mobile AI data centers that they're putting on the well pads because they can actually do something with the gas, not have to deal with the infrastructure, take away capacities, as well as make maybe more money than they would get if they just sold it into the pipeline. And so there's different challenges and considerations from a mineral owner perspective that come with these shut-in wells. There might be a, a couple of other knock-on effects that occur around, okay, well, what are the operators going to do to get around that issue if it's a infrastructure issue? And I need to protect my rights to make sure I'm still getting paid a market value for gas and be aware that market value in West Texas might be a dollar an MCF. And even though you know gas is $2.50 at Henry Hub or whatever, and that is the market price in that local area just because there's an excess amount of gas. And so you have to, you know, as long as you're getting the market price, whatever they do with it, you know, really shouldn't be our concern, in my opinion, because they're doing what they need to do to produce the oil. And, and that that's the reason they're doing that. If it were primarily a gas, well, most of the time they wouldn't be doing those types of things because it would be more economic. And there's so much gas that more so more than you could deal with power generation on site and things like that. But yeah, for oil production, think about the bigger picture it means that they're producing oil and we're getting paid royalties. And yeah, the gas royalty is small, but so would the gas royalty be if we actually sold it in the pipeline because it's just an oversupply situation there. So yeah, lots of other considerations. If you go down the rabbit hole of why did the well get shut in? Is it, how long is it going to last? And there could be a bunch of other things to think about as well. You said it, Matt. In, In this episode, we've talked a lot about the physical reasons, operational reasons, price reasons, Um, But there are also situations where it's strategic reasons. And this might be the reason that they would plug and abandon a well that uh, maybe did have some life left. But Matt, we've heard about situations where the lease becomes overburdens with overrides. And maybe it's hard to be economic with leases. Maybe there is just too much burden on that lease from it being signed in the 40s or 50s and just being sold and overrides being assigned. So that could be a reason as well that an operator is looking at plugging and abandoning an area and going out and releasing an area, which is not unheard of, especially in West Texas. Yeah, that's a great point. And you know, we covered that in a lot more detail in episode 228, what you should know about lease washouts. And that scenario that Justin mentioned is a lease washout scenario. In other words, where basically the operator looks to wipe the slate clean and release the same acreage without those burdens in place so that they can go and drill new wells. And so definitely listen to that if you are in that situation. You know, I think that's a good thing to think about is, okay, what if this well gets plugged and abandoned next? What are, what's the activity nearby? And those are all the things you need to be looking into and be familiar with your state oil and gas commission website. And we, we did a series of videos on that for the, the major oil and gas producing states, how to navigate those, how to find your minerals there. And you can go back to my YouTube channel and check that out. Just go to the link on the Mineral Rights Podcast website to find my YouTube channel. And and that kind of brings up a good point related to diving into that information. Justin, do you want to talk kind of at a high level? What can you find from these state oil and gas commissions about your wells, You know, whether it's plugged and abandoned or temporarily abandoned or shut in? You nailed it, Matt. Going to that episode, watching that episode will kind of help to explain where to find this information. But this is information you can find with the state oil and gas commission for at least some of it. Maybe not everything, Uh, But if they are working over that well, if they um, are getting approval to repair the well bore, whatever it might be, you'll see this information in the Oil and Gas Commission information. Um, Matt, I don't know if that's necessarily the case as much for if they were just shutting it in for price reasons. But if there is major work going on in that well that gets the government organization involved, 
you'll definitely see it there. Yeah, that's a great point. So definitely be familiar with your State Oil and Gas Commission website. You'll find out what they're doing, what the plans are, what the reasons are maybe for why the wells shut in. You'll see different uh, communications or filings uh, on that well that will just explain what their plans are. They need approval sometimes to go do certain things or to find Braden head test results, for example, to find out is that a reason why the well was shut in. So all those things are available typically through those state commission websites, uh, really useful. And then the shut-in for a long period of time, remember to go back to your lease, see what the shut-in royalty provisions are. If it is shut-in for an extended period of time, typically the operator will owe you shut-in payments. And so make sure that you enforce your rights through the lease if you're in this situation. But hopefully this has been helpful in just giving you some ideas of whether a uh, shut-in well uh, can be reopened, or if a plugged-in abandoned well can be recompleted and then reopened. And uh, you know the answer is sometimes yes. And hopefully for a shut-in well, the answer is definitely yes, so that you continue to receive royalties. But if not, you understand now a little bit some of the reasoning why that might be the case. So thanks again for listening. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.